As one of the longest-running sitcoms in television history, The Jeffersons was groundbreaking in many ways. The series aired its final episode in 1985 and has managed to remain a cultural touchstone. Here is what the show's biggest fans never knew about The Jeffersons. The Black experience wasn't portrayed much or at all on television prior to the 1970s. When shows featured Black characters, they were often portrayed as stereotypes or ominous criminals. So when shows like Norman Lear's Good Times hit the airwaves in the early 1970s, it was seen as a step of progress. Finally, relatable Black stories were being told, and Black actors were getting significant roles on TV. However, this didn't satisfy everybody. Members of the Black Panther Party set up a meeting with Lear to discuss good times. They complained that shows featuring Black casts always portrayed Black people as poor, reinforcing some stereotypes even as they undermined others. The patriarch of the Evans family in Good Times had to work several jobs to support his large family, and they noted that Black characters in general were often depicted in cheap clothing and in other negative ways. As the Atlanta Black Star notes, the Panthers told Lear that there were successful Black people in the world whose stories could be compelling and funny. The conversation resonated with Lear, and he began to conceive the Jeffersons as an effort to show a Black family having real economic success and living the American dream. The idea of moving on up came out of that visit. We were going to do the Jeffersons, but let's make them move on up. Sitcoms aren't always noted for their complex writing and deeply imagined characters, and The Jeffersons was in many ways a broad, superficial comedy that relied on racially charged jokes and physical comedy to get laughs, which is why it's easy to forget that George Jefferson actually had a fascinating fictional background story that was more thoughtful than your typical sitcom fare. That backstory went back to the Jefferson family's roots in Alabama as sharecroppers, a detail that spoke volumes about George Jefferson's obsession with wealth, status, and the visual signs of both. George worked as a janitor for a large apartment building while his wife, Louise Wheezy Jefferson, worked as a housekeeper. An insurance settlement allowed George to quit his job and launch his first dry cleaning business, which in turn allowed the Jeffersons to move from Harlem to Queens and finally to make the move to Manhattan. Although this backstory wasn't explicitly referenced, it showed up in the writing. Wheezy is initially reluctant to hire a housekeeper in the first episode, in part because she's had that experience herself. And in one episode, when George is told that a white worker should be referred to as a custodian, he remarks that if he was black, he'd be called a janitor. Television historians know that while the character of George Jefferson was introduced on All in the Family in 1971, he didn't actually show up on screen until 1973. The reason given was that he was uncomfortable walking into a white man's house, setting up the character as a foil for Archie Bunker's racism. But the real reason was more pragmatic. Norman Lear had created the character for Sherman Hemsley, but Hemsley was under contract for the play Perlee and refused to break it. Hemsley had built a reputation as a powerhouse performer, and after catching his 1970 performance in Perlee, Lear knew he wanted Hemsley for the character of George. Rather than cast someone else, however, Lear decided to keep George off-screen until Hemsley was available. Until then, Lear created the character of Henry Jefferson, George's brother. Portrayed by Mel Stewart, Henry got the lines and screen time that would have gone to George. Stewart's last appearance as Henry was Hemsley's first appearance as George. Henry Jefferson was never seen again. Marla Gibbs remains best known to many people as the sarcastic housekeeper Florence on The Jeffersons. It was her breakout role. Gibbs had started taking acting classes when her job with United Airlines transferred her from Detroit to Los Angeles. But prior to being cast as Florence, the actress had only appeared in a handful of theater roles and one film, 1973's Sweet Jesus Preacher Man. Florence was only supposed to be a bit part, but audiences loved her, and the character of Florence was promoted to full-time status. But Gibbs knew how quickly fortunes turned in Hollywood. She'd already been working for United Airlines for 11 years when she got the job on the Jeffersons, and kept working there for two more years. Gibbs' reasoning for keeping her day job was that she didn't want to give up a good gig for an acting role that might disappear at any moment. Gibbs says that she worked out an adjusted schedule with United that allowed her enough time to film her scenes and then race into work, where she worked the phones in their reservations office. Often, people calling in to book flights would tell her that her voice sounded familiar, and she'd just laugh it off. One other reason she kept her job despite becoming famous on a top-rate television show? She got unlimited travel passes from the airline. 
Despite earning praise for its progressive depiction of Black America on the small screen, The Jeffersons still earns criticism for some of its choices. As noted by The Baltimore Sun, many Black Americans found aspects of the show, from George Jefferson's so-called pimp walk strut to his general foolishness, to be offensive. But as Ebony writes, this was a deliberate calibration by the show's creators to make the show and the character of George Jefferson more palatable to audiences not quite ready to accept blacks as their equals. The character of George Jefferson was conceived as a photonegative image in some ways of Archie Bunker. Both men are bigoted and both use sarcasm and insults as weapons. I mean, who should know better than my own family the respect I have for women? We even got the damn door! <laughs> However, white audiences could feel good about being more racially sensitive and evolved than Bunker, whereas George Jefferson's upward mobility could be seen as threatening. Making George a little ridiculous softened the blow, because it made it clear that no matter how successful he and his family might be, they would always be second class. You are so boring, I'd rather spend an evening with King Tut. <laughs> In some ways, 1975 doesn't seem so long ago, but it was truly a different time in more ways than one. In 2021, a transgender person is a member of the president's cabinet, and the vice president of the United States is in an interracial marriage. Back in 1975, however, issues like these were shocking to the vast majority of the country and also almost never addressed on television. That is, until the Jeffersons came along. The list of firsts achieved by the Jeffersons is impressive. It was the first TV show to directly address suicide in an episode where Florence the housekeeper falls into a depression and contemplates ending her life. MeTV also points out that The Jeffersons was the first sitcom on primetime television to depict a transgender character. George's old Navy pal, Eddie, revealed to now be Edie. Additionally, the show was also the first in American television history to depict an interracial marriage with the characters Helen and Tom Willis. It's rare for a television comedy to lead cultural change like this, but in more ways than one, The Jeffersons did. One of the reasons The Jeffersons remains a pop culture powerhouse when many of its contemporaries have faded from our collective memory is the theme song. Simply put, Moving On Up is just a great song, full stop. Everybody knows it and you can't help but sing along. It's also one of the more thoughtful and meaningful theme songs in TV history. The song was co-written by Jeanne Dubois, who portrayed Wilona on Norman Lear's other show Good Times, and Jeff Barry. Barry is something of a legend. He co-wrote a long list of classic songs, including Dadu Ron Ron, Then He Kissed Me, Be My Baby, and Leader of the Pack. Dubois wanted to do more than just act, and when she approached Lear about branching out, he suggested that she write the theme song for his new show. Dubois infused the song with her own story, as she always dreamed of moving her mother into a deluxe apartment when she achieved success. The song also adamantly drew from black culture, styled almost as a spiritual tune complete with a 35-member choir that wouldn't have been out of place in church. It was almost totally unlike any other theme song you would hear on TV at the time, which was the whole point. On one level, The Jeffersons is just a silly sitcom, and George Jefferson is a very silly character, prone to foolish schemes and loud, boorish outbursts. But he's actually one of the most complex characters in TV history. While it's easy to view George Jefferson as a black Archie Bunker, that's not entirely accurate because George Jefferson is beyond Archie Bunker in many ways. Archie is a working class man who will never go beyond his working day in the easy chair in his modest house. George and his family, however, are destined to move on up and leave the bunkers behind in a world they'll never escape. More importantly, as one of the writers on the show, Jay Moriarty told the Hollywood Times, Archie Bunker's bigotry is, quote, pure prejudice, while George Jefferson's bigotry is a reaction to that prejudice. Bunker has no reason to hate blacks or to view them as inferior. Jefferson has plenty of reasons to distrust white people and the power structures they use to oppress them. Many of the actors working on the Jeffersons were serious artists with a lot of training. Sherman Hemsley, for example, came out of the revered Negro Ensemble Company, or NEC, as did Roxy Roker, who portrayed Helen Willis on the series. Other NEC graduates include John Amos, Richard Roundtree, Denzel Washington, and Angela Bassett. Hemsley was so good, show creator Norman Lear waited years to be able to hire him. Hemsley was very experienced and took his performance very seriously, so when he flubbed lines during episode tapings, it's safe to assume it wasn't due to nerves or incompetence, it was merely a form of passive resistance. 
Early seasons of the show used racial epithets for both black and white characters fairly often, but as time went on, Hemsley thought his character should be evolving and no longer using offensive words. As New Ravel notes, when Hemsley's requests for change were ignored, he began deliberately flubbing his lines or saying the offensive words too low for the microphones to pick up, forcing the producers to reshoot scenes. Eventually, this tactic worked, and the writer stopped using the offensive terms. The Jeffersons was a consistently high-rated show, and only the second sitcom with a majority black cast to land in the top five of the Nielsen ratings. Over the course of its 11-year run, the series was almost always one of the most watched on television, which makes it curious that its network, CBS, treated it as if the show was in trouble. The show's time slot, for example, changed a ridiculous 15 times over those 11 years. Normally, successful shows are allowed to develop in a specific time slot in order to become an anchor for the network. But for some reason, The Jeffersons was moved around constantly, forcing viewers to search for it, then figure out how to rearrange their viewing schedules to accommodate it. When the show was canceled in 1985, the network didn't even bother to inform the cast. The actors found out through the media reports or when friends contacted them to ask about it. This was perceived as an act of deep disrespect by many of the cast members, and it also meant that one of the most successful and longest-running comedies of all time didn't get to have a proper series finale. Check out one of our newest videos right here. Plus, even more grunge videos about your favorite stuff are coming soon. Subscribe to our YouTube channel and hit the bell so you don't miss a single one.